Uh, I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me, uh, first of all, to Nehemiah chapter number 10. Nehemiah chapter number 10. Uh, Nehemiah, of course, that book tells us of the rebuilding of the wall. And uh, that city, uh, the God, God is not, uh, I, let me see how I can put this so you won't get your feelings hurt. Uh, God chose Israel. Now, God did not choose America. But America chose God. That's how it started. But now America has chose to run God out. And God is going to show us very soon what it, what it's like when God's not around. And uh, we are already beginning to see results of what it's like when God's not around. I read one of the most startling things I've read in a long time just a few days ago when uh, the news showed the picture on the, uh, the, the Internet uh, news or whatever. They have pictures on there. And they, they showed and told about the laws passed now in California to, uh, to, so queers can get married and have benefits of, of the marriage that God set up and uh, showed uh, uh, two old women together trying to get married, 87 years old, and one was 83 or 84. And I thought, my God, what has this world come to? We're living in a in a wicked generation, a generation that don't know God. And, and, uh, and then I was able last week, God let me run across some material about, about this subject and how that uh, evil is being marketed in America. And, and, and the guy explains how, uh, how that evil is being marketed. In this country. And, and, and so you pray for me because I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to study that and I'm gonna, uh, maybe be able to help you and enlighten you on some areas of how that we've allowed evil to come in. And not only have we allowed it to come in, we've many instances opened the door and invited it in. And so, you, you help us to pray about that, and we're going to be studying on that real soon. And I, I want to help you. I believe we're, I, I believe that one of the, uh, ways that you combat, uh, that, that stuff is to, is to tell it and preach it everywhere you go. Amen. Amen. Uh, you, you know how to, uh, it doesn't take much, not much anymore that convicts a sodomite. Amen. They don't have any morals. They don't have any fiber of morals. They don't, they could care less about, uh, right. Amen. And so, the only thing that really convinces them is telling them they're sodomites. And it's not right. Amen. And so, you help us pray about that. I wanna, I'm gonna give you some information very soon, Lord William. And I wanna help you this morning just for a little while. Amen. In Nehemiah chapter 10, we're going to read just a verse here, and I want to uh, turn a couple places, and, and uh, you pray for us. I want to try to give you the message that God has placed upon our heart. I, I believe it's needful this hour. I believe we're living in that hour when, uh, when many of God's people are, are leaving or are quitting. Uh, many are not real anymore. We're plastic Christians. Uh, we're not what we say we are. Amen. And so, Nehemiah, watch what he says in Nehemiah chapter number 10. And look with me, please, at verse number 39. In Nehemiah chapter 10 and verse number 39, the Bible says, For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn. Well, we just heard about that. Yeah, amen. amen. You know something about, do you know that God is pleased with corn? Yeah, 
Did you know that? Do you know that corn is a is a good Bible word? Amen. I mean, corn is something that uh, Jesus talked about. A corn of wheat falling to the ground, and and uh, you got so you got God's seed. Amen. But then you have a seed that God uses to show us uh, wickedness. Or in other words, let's put it like this: You have a you have a grain of corn that uh, that uh, that magnifies God. You know, when corn grows, even the roots grow upward. Everything about corn grows toward God. Everything, even the root. You, you you don't have to dig much. With corn, the roots, you can see them shooting up. Amen? The roots are. But not so with the mustard seed. Mustard seed is all about self. And where a corn reaches up to God, mustard seed reaches out to man. And the Bible says when it grows up, it, it makes great branches. It branches out. And the birds there come and lodge in the branches thereof. Amen. Now I said before, when you anytime you get a bunch of birds in the tree, you got a mess on the ground. Amen. And so there's a difference. Look at what he says here. That ain't got nothing to do with what I'm gonna preach. <laughs> but it didn't hurt you, did it? He said. Uh, uh, the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn and of the new wine and the oil unto the chambers where are the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister and the porters and the singers. You know what that sounds like? Sounds like they're going to have church. Then it, isn't that what it looks like? Looks like they're fixing to have church. And the singers, and we, notice what he says, and we will not forsake the house of our God. I like it right there. I, I like that, amen. I mean, he said, you know something, we ain't going to forsake God's house. We, that's the last thing we're going to forsake. Yeah, amen. You see that thing? Yeah. All right, look with me now, if you will, at uh, Second Kings, quickly. Just hold your place. Look with me at Second Kings. Now, Nehemiah said, we're not going to forsake the house of our God. Yeah, amen? amen? Yeah. And Nehemiah uh, said that. But look at Second Kings. In Second Kings, chapter number 20. Second Kings chapter 20. And we know that, I don't have time to go into it, but we know that in Second Kings 20, uh, God is showing us and telling us about uh, the life of Hezekiah and how that it was extended after he prayed. Amen? You remember the story, Hezekiah uh, got sick, God sent Isaiah to tell him, uh, get his house in order, he's going to die and not live. And Hezekiah began to pray. And God heard his cry. And God sent Isaiah again to tell him, uh, listen, I'm going to add 15 years unto your life. And, and But notice here, in the midst of all that, notice verse number 15. And he said, What have they seen in thy house. They're asking Hezekiah that. Well, what did they see in your house? When they came by, what did they see? Amen? And uh, then I want you to just 
with that in mind, look with me please at Mark chapter number 2. I, I promise you I'm going to try my best to bring all this together. In Mark chapter number 2 and in uh, verse number 1. In Mark chapter 2, verse number 1, of course, we have the story of how the, uh, the four, you know, Jesus was in the house, and how the four, uh, the man was born of four, amen? You say, uh, you know, I started to preach a message a few weeks ago, and God stopped me. I guess it wasn't real spiritual. <laughs> but I started to preach on four of a kind beats a full house, <laughs> Amen? <laughs> And uh, think about it, that'll preach, amen? Uh, but in chapter 2, in Mark chapter 2, and the Bible says in verse 1, And again he entered, talking about Jesus, into Capernaum uh, after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press... They uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy laid. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now listen, I, I, there's no way that I can uh, uh, spend a lot of time just going over all of this. I want you to get something this morning. I want you to see how many different entities are in the house. Amen. Uh, first of all, we see that Jesus is in the house. Amen. Can I just say you can get a lot of things done when God comes around. Amen. Uh, you can get a lot of things accomplished when God comes around. Amen. Uh, so Jesus is in the house. And not only is Jesus in the house, but we see we've got some believers in the house. Uh, there's some folks that believe God that's in the house. Amen. And then we're going to have some unbelievers that's in the house. Amen. Anytime you get in a, a crowd of people, a group of people at church, there's always going to be somebody lost. I mean, just about every time you come together, somebody's going to need God. Amen. And so we got, we got the Lord in the house. We got unbelievers in the house. We got believers Believers in the house. We got sick folks in the house. Can anybody say amen right there? Amen. Anytime you get a crowd that big, somebody's bound to have something wrong. Amen. Uh, there's bound to be somebody with some kind of an ailment or something going on in their life. And so uh, we see there's a lot of different people in the house. Can I say something by way of introduction this morning? Uh, there's uh, there's a four attitudes of people in the local church. There's four attitudes. You need to get a hold of this. It'll help you. This is my introduction. There's four attitudes of people in the local church. Amen. Uh, let me give them to you real quick. Number one, uh, there's the lovers. Amen. In other words, those are the ones that love the things of God. They love the house of God. Uh, they love the people of God. They love the book of God. They love the ways of God. They love the songs of God. They love the things at the house of God. That's an attitude, by the way. Yeah, you say, preacher, I, I don't have that kind of attitude. Wait, well, maybe you ought to get one. Amen. I'm telling you, that's an attitude. Now listen, can I help you for a minute? Everybody under the sound of my voice is going to line up on one of these attitudes. Amen. I just give you the best one. It goes downhill from here. Amen. 
I'm telling you, there's some lovers at the house of God. There's some love, but not only that, there's some likers. Amen. Uh, you see, that means uh, that's them that kind of uh, kind of agree with things and kind of go along with things, uh, but they don't necessarily love everything. They don't necessarily, you know, they kind of, they enjoy it sometimes and sometimes they don't. I mean, it's just, you know, they, they like church, but they sometimes don't love church. It's getting quieter. Is, it, is, that, a, is that a sign that, that point number four is going to be dead? I'll just stop right there. Amen. I'm telling you that uh, we got some lovers. I'm talking about attitudes. Now, these are people uh, uh, that accept things the way they are. Amen. Now, a lover just loves it the way it is. And, and whatever the preacher says is fine. Whatever we preach is fine. Whatever we sing is fine. They just love being around things of God. But then you got these likers. They just accept it, amen? Uh, they accept uh, the way things are. And then, uh, now listen, uh, they're attracted to the church. Uh, but every once in a while, they find a few flies in the ointment. I mean, every once in a while. Listen, I mean, they like everything, uh, but they just don't love it all. And every once in a while, they find a few flies. And But now listen, they wouldn't criticize for nothing in the world. Hello? Amen? I mean, they, they, I mean it, to them, it would just be rude to criticize. You understand, they're kind of tinkering with God and the world. Amen. And so you got the attitude of the likers. You got the lovers, but then you got the likers, but then you got the dislikers. I told you it's going downhill, amen. Uh, these people are very critical about the church, and they don't mind saying so. Are you hearing what I'm telling you, folks? Uh, they find the church substandard to their life. And, and however, they're willing to give it an opportunity to meet their standards before they leave. I'm talking about, I'm talking about unlockers. It don't matter what you have for supper, it's always gonna be a complaint. It don't matter what kind of book, what kind of song you sing, they're gonna wish you to sing another different one. It don't make any difference. Hey, if the preacher preaches, uh, he's either preached too long, if he ain't preached too long, he's preached too short. If he's preached too short, it's cause he didn't study enough. If he preaches too long, it's cause he studied too much. I mean, uh, I mean, they're always going to find something wrong in the church. But they won't leave as long as you can meet their standards. Hello? Are you with me? Oh, well, the Nixon's going to just run us out then. Amen? Now, you've got the lovers and you've got the likers and then you've got the dislikers. But then you got the haters. Amen. Oh, oh, Taylor hater. Amen. He's just a hater. I mean, this ain't nothing going to say. Hey, these don't like anything about the church. And from their perspective, it's a hopeless case. It's, un it's ungodly. They don't want nothing to do with it. Amen. And you rarely, listen, you don't hardly ever, Brother Tim, you hardly ever hear them criticize. You say, why, preacher? Because they don't stay long enough. They're not going to hang around long enough to find nothing wrong with it because everything's wrong with it. You ever seen some of them that come in and, and, and maybe they'll be there two Sundays, but the first Sunday they come in, they got, all they got is something bad to say about church. And so probably you won't see them again. I could list, I would to God, I had a list of all the people that I've met that's come through here and out of here in one Sunday. 
I, one feller came one time. All I did was make mention that uh, Martin Luther King was a communist. I'm not. I didn't. I didn't say nothing. I didn't make a racial statement. You did that in your mind. All I did was tell the truth. And then that feller left. I didn't see him no more. A few weeks went by, and the brother told me why he didn't come. And I mean, it's just like that all the time. Every time you turn around, somebody comes in, and they don't stay, and you wonder why they didn't stay. Because as soon as they came in, they seen something they didn't like, and they're not going to give God a chance with their life. Amen? Are you listening to me? I'm talking about attitude. I'm telling you, everybody under the sound of my voice has fit one of those modes. Now, I could have went on and said a lot more about them. But I'm just trying to get busy and finish here for you. Give me 25 minutes, brother. And, and now listen, I want you to see some things. And so we've got these attitudes. Now we got a house. Are you listening? Jesus is in the house. The believers are in the house. The unbelievers are in the house. Sick people are in the house. Dead people, cold people, hot people. Well, they're all there. Amen? Now listen, I want to give you now, oh, this is the message. If you'll, if you'll just bear with me just for a few minutes. Amen? I want to preach to you just for a little bit on the Bible housing authority. Amen? And I just, here's what I want to do. It ain't going to take long. I'm going to give you three types of church members that we'll see in this past, in these few minutes. Amen? Just, I want to, can I help you? I mean, and you know what's amazing about these? Uh, they're just exactly like the only three types of people that live in houses. You say, what do you mean? Well, I give them to you to start with. Number one, you got your freeloaders, amen. And number two, you got your renters. And number three, you got your buyers. Or your homeowners. Amen. In other words, let me just hit. In other words, the freeloader, he's an unbeliever. He's an unsaved person. He has nothing to do with things of God. He don't know God. Amen. Now, a renter, he knows God, but he's carnal minded. He's worldly minded. And that's what I want to talk to you. And a homeowner, they're saved, sound, sealed, and sure. Amen. Will you let me give you those just for a few minutes? Uh, first of all, let me show you the freeloader. Amen. Uh, this freeloader concerning houses, uh, he's an unbeliever. Uh, he Listen, you know what he'll do? He'll live in the house. He don't mind living in the house. Uh, matter of fact, uh, but the problem is this. They won't pay rent. They're not, don't ask them for it. They're not going to give rent. They're not going to do anything to improve the house. They're not going to do anything to maintain the house. They're not going to do anything. You say, why? Because they're lost. I'm talking about church people. I'm talking about people that go to church. They're never going to tithe. They're never going to give an offering. They're never going to support missions. They're not going to do anything to improve church. You know why they came? To see if God or the church could do something for them. You say, why, preacher? Because they're freeloaders. They don't care about God. They don't care if we have a piano that's broke or fixed. They don't care what songs we sing. They don't, now if you get to shouting too much, they'll get uneasy. Amen? But you say, what kind of people are they, preacher? They're just freeloaders. Amen? They won't pay for nothing. Don't ask them to fix nothing. Amen? Uh, they only... Now, here's what they do now. They only give when they feel like it. Amen? Have I heard anybody yet? They only give when they feel like it. Well, the problem is they hardly ever feel like it. 
Matter of fact, they live by their feelings. They're led. Listen, they won't, they won't help missionaries. God help you. God forgive you. If you're a church member and say you love God and you won't support missions, you won't give to help somebody uh, come to know Jesus. Hey, God bless your heart. Somebody helped you one day. Somebody prayed for you. Amen. Somebody preached to you. You stinking good for nothing. Freeloader you. You come here and all you expect is God give me. People give me. What's in it for me? I'm telling you, I'm sick and tired of the church being a doormat for the stinking world that hates God and robs God's people. Amen. I would to God some of you could sit in there and get the, I don't I, I don't do that anymore. I got my phone. I carry around with me now. Thanks to AT&T or, or, or Ma Bell or something like that. Now we can, you can't go nowhere. They can find you. I, I mean, and you know what they'll do? Hey, preacher, how you doing, preacher? Oh, hey, ain't Jesus precious? Don't you love Jesus? Boy, it's a good day to be alive, ain't it? God's been good, ain't he? Boy, I'll tell you what. I, we just serve a wonderful God. Preacher, can you get me, get me some power bill money? Well, you see, and then I'll say, well, now listen. Uh, and I'm, I'll say, brother, because I'm assuming that because they done been bragging 15 minutes on God. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i assuming they're brothers. Well, now listen, brother. Uh, can I just ask you a question? Oh, sure, sure. I, I'd be glad to answer anything, you know, whatever. I, well, all right, answer me this. Where do you go to church? Well, preacher, uh, you know, funny you should mention that. I've been, you know, kind of in between churches. Yeah, well, where, where, where's the last one you... Well, and then they'll come up with some off the wall. Yeah, I remember that. And they changed names about 12 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, you know, the past... Well, yeah, do, I, I remember his name was Dr. Something. Yeah, yeah that's what he was, Dr. Something. Yeah. And, and you know what? And then, and then here's what I have to oh. tell them. Look, if my church member was suffering and had lost their job and lost their and couldn't keep their lights on, I'd still have to really pray hard. And if God give me the green light, we'd take up a love offering it to church and we'd help our church member keep their lights on. And uh, But you see, I just don't have no money to just... Pass out, and I said, "Now I hope you understand, because I get four or five calls a week like this." And surely you, oh yeah, I understand. Uh, and and you go on and talk a few more minutes, and before it's over with, they're mad at you. Well, I thought y'all was supposed to be a church. You ain't no church. I thought y'all was supposed to help people. You don't help me. I thought, and on and on and on, I'm telling you, that's a freeloader. That's how they are. They don't want God. They don't want the book. They don't want preaching. They can care less about Sunday school. Hey, I've had, you wouldn't believe. You know what? Some of them are so stupid. I had one guy come in here Wednesday night at quarter to seven. Fifteen minutes for church. More than one occasion, but I remember this one in particular. And he come in my office. I mean, 15 minutes, church is fixing to start, and want me to give them two nights in a motel room. Him and his wife, she's in the car. And I, and I started talking to him. And you know what? He, he just, you wouldn't believe the, 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 uh, the scriptures he didn't quote. And I said, I said, what does this mean to you? I was young and now I'm old, and I've not seen the righteous forsaken or a seed be- begging bread. I said, friend, what does that mean to you? He said, he took his hat off, and he said, that tells me 
my God is going to take care of me. That's what he said. And I said, all right. I said, don't mean nothing else. I said, what about that word righteous? I said, that word means right with God. In other words, I believe it means this. If you're right with God, God's got a responsibility to take care of you. You understand? Hey, I, remember I told you a while back, if a fellow come by the church, and he come in walking in the door, said, I'm hungry, preacher. You know what You know what I said you ought to do if I'm not here? You ought to go in there and open up that freezer and get him a pack of deer meat. And give it to him. And if he needs it, get him a couple matches. Hello? See, some of you get mad at me about that. The Bible says man don't work, don't eat. Amen? Neither should he eat. Is that right? Well, preacher, I mean, Lord of mercy, why don't you just give him, give him some money so he go by? No, that ain't what God wants him to do. I'm not going to give him God's money so he can go down and buy him a fifth and celebrate the fourth. Hello? Are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, you see what the problem is? They're just freeloaders. I took a deacon here back about a year and a half ago. We went over here on uh, this DeSoto Parkway over here and went over to a man's house and drove up in his yard and had three, a uh, couple sacks and boxes of groceries, two or three of them, I believe. Milk, bread, bologna, cheese, peanut butter. I mean, we went to the grocery store. Ladies bought all kind of, I would have gone there and took it to my house. I didn't have them kind of groceries in my house. And then and we took them over there. I said, all right, buddy, here's what I want you to do. Wife and several youngins running around. I said, here's, I said, here's all, I, all I'm asking you is this. I'm going out there in the car, and I'm going to bring them groceries in here, and I'm going to leave them on this table, and they're yours, no strings attached. And all I'm asking you to do is give God three consecutive services. Just three. Just all I'm asking you to do. And I said, you don't have a vehicle? Our bus will be by here every service. Somebody in the van will come by here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Three services. Just come. Three times. Give God three strikes. You know what that man did? He said, oh, you're right, preacher. We've been looking for a church anyway. I need to get in church. Need my family needs church. I that's just that ain't even why would you even suggest we was gonna try to come anyway? I tell you what, preacher, you just mark it down, count on it, tell them to send the bus, we'll be there in the morning. I thought this is too easy. I we went outside, brought them groceries in, set them on there, and before I got back to the church, he was on the phone cussing at my wife. I think I'll bring them groceries blankety blank down there and set them on the porch at your church. And my wife didn't know what to make up. And he's just a cussing me and cussing the, the deacon and cussing the groceries and cuss and and my wife just happened to see me coming in. And she said, Hang on just a minute. My husband just walked in. Let me let you talk to him. And I got on the phone. I didn't know who it was. And it's the guy we just left cussing like a sailor. And you know what he was trying to do? Throw his voice and make him sound like he was his brother. You come up here to my brother's house and come in here and demand them to come to church for you. will give them young and some milk. And then I want him to cuss. He said, I'm going to bring them blankety-blank groceries down there and set them on your porch. I said, I'll tell you what. You put them groceries in the car and bring them down here and set them on the porch. Yeah, amen. Yeah. And then I said, wait a minute. As a matter of fact, let me, let me tell you, let me give you another option. You keep the groceries. Stay at home. Forget about the deal. 
and then his tomb changed. I said, no, no, I don't, it's over. We don't want the groceries back. You, you see what I'm saying, folks? I'm telling you, you, this is the most hateful, most wicked, most selfish, self-centered, God-robbing, God-hating generation I ever seen in all my life. I'm telling you, hey, hey, no wonder God ought to break our backs and fling us in hell. This wicked world hates God and mocks God and scoffs at God and robs God and never thanks God. Hey, if I was God, I wouldn't waste another five minutes on America. I'd burn it to a crisp. But thank God for our sakes He don't. Amen. Thank God for the long suffering of God. You see, you got them preloaders. Amen. I'll hurry with these other two. Let me give you a couple real quick. Amen. You see, you got you got three types of church doors. You got them freeloaders. Amen. They're unbelievers. They're unsafe. They live in the house. They don't pay rent. They don't do anything to maintain the house. They won't improve the house. They only give if they feel like it. They never pay tithe. They only care about what they can get out of the house. Amen. And you know what they'll say? Here's what, here's, here's what, here's what that kind of say. What do y'all have to offer our children? Watch that crowd. What do you got for our kids? How about Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Then you got then you got not only freeloaders, but then you got renters. Amen. You got them renters. Now what is that? That's carnal Christians. Amen. I'll just read you these. I wrote down we'll be done. You got carnal Christians. You see, they're willing to provide limited care as long as their best interest is in heart. Amen? As long as it works out for their benefit, they'll help. Amen? Their relationship is considered tentative. So their care is viewed as short term. Hello? It's like a person who rents a house and is willing to stay as long as the contract uh, works for their benefit and it seems fair or until they get a better offer down the road. Amen? Now, this person is willing to pay a reasonable rent and keep the house clean, but they will not make repairs. They will not make improvements. Hello? Amen? It is the landlord's job to keep the place attractive enough for the renter to stay and keep paying rent. Amen? That's the way they feel. And in other words, it's like this. They'll tithe for a short time. Right. Amen. Or maybe they'll tithe sporadically. Right. Once in a while. In other words, uh, they'll give a little money to buy a pew as long as you can put their name on the end of it. Right. Amen, uh, they might help with the uh, building the upstairs and finishing the church if you'll put a name on a plaque and hang it on the wall when they're dead. Yeah, amen. You see, they're, they're renters. They're not buyers. They're not invested in the church. They don't care really about the building. All they care about is whether or not the money they're giving is going to come back to them. Amen. Have I hurt anything yet? You see, we got church members like that. You ain't going to give nothing and walk away from it. Everything they give has got a hook on the other end and a fishing rod on this end. They want to make sure they can reel it back in. 
Well, we just going. We'll just, you know, we're going to give. But preacher, now, you know, we got to feel like we have our say. So this is not the Moose Lodge. It don't work that way here. When you give your money, you give it to God. It's God's business what He does. It's not our business. I don't give I don't give my tithe and then say, Now God, I want to see the books, I want to know where it's going, I want to know it's not your business. Hello. You it's not your money. Are we are we all right? Is everything okay? And we got so you got these renters, and they're not really concerned. They'll never put a piece of carpet in the house. They're never going to throw paint on the wall. They're never going to help the upkeep of the place. They're just not concerned about it unless it benefits them. You say, why is that, preacher? Because they're renters. Now, listen to me. Can I help you? You know what that crowd does? That crowd will move as soon as they see a church with something a little more that their interest or a little more that they like, they're going down the road. Those are not the kind that's going to be here. You mark my words now, folks. Can I, can I help you this morning? Can I help? Is it all right? Some of you are winners. And you're not in it for the long haul. You're in it as long as you can get something out of it. And one of these days, hey, you say, how, do you, how can you say that? How do you know that, preacher? Because we have family after family after family after family that's already done it. And you're going to follow suit if you're a renter. Are you listening? Amen? Let me finish. Then we got, then we got not only the freeloaders. They don't care about nothing. They're not going to give. Then you got the renters. They're going to give if it benefits them. Are you listening? And then you got the buyer or the homeowner attitude of a Christian. Now, that person is saved. They're sold out. They're settled. They're sealed. They're sure. Amen. Listen, uh, to acquire possession to purchase ownership, to accept, to believe, to nail it down. That's what they are, amen? Willing to demonstrate a spiritual operation has happened by making permanent changes to their own behavior or their own lifestyle. Listen, they're not willing to change the church. They're willing to change their self. Are you listening to me? You say, why? They're buyers. They're homeowners. They're invested in it. Amen? They're planning a long-term relationship with the church and are viewed as permanent. They're willing to do repairs. They're willing to fix changes. They're willing to paint. They're willing to install new carpet. They're willing to replace the roof, uh, even remodel, rebuild, reshelve, rebuy, so it can be comfortable and useful. In other words, they're going to tithe. They're going to give the missions. If we got to buy a piano, they're going to all chip in. Amen. If we got to if we got to buy a vacuum cleaner, they're going to chip in. We're going to do this. Uh, uh, brother said something to me a while back, uh, been a while some time ago, and and I and I'm no way. Now listen to me, no way is this a bad on his behalf. Okay, it, it just was a thought, and he, and, the, and his intention was great. But we was talking about paying uh, uh, some things at the church need to. Paying the building payment. He said, he said, well, preacher, what if we was to have a, a, a bake sale every month? I said, brother, we're not going to have a bake sale to do what God said to do with tithe. Are you with me? Now, listen to me, folks. Ain't nothing wrong with having a bake sale, is it? I ain't nothing wrong. I like cakes. 
I'd have probably bought a lot of them. I mean, carrot cakes and, you know, and apple dumpling cakes and dump cakes and all kinds. Just dump them in my house. I like them. I'd put good money out for some of you ladies' cakes. I've tasted them. I know I'm getting my money's worth. But you can't use it to pay the payment of the building that God said to use the tithe for. Now, we get all our bills paid, pay all our missionaries, got a little money in the bank. Y'all want to have a bake sale? We'll have a bake sale. We can take our money and play poker with it. That's right. Four of a kind beats a full house. Amen. Are you with me? Yes, sir. But I'm talking about buyers. Amen. I'm talking about folks that sold out. Yeah. They got saved and they said, you know what? I didn't get in to get out. Amen, yeah. I didn't back my car in the parking lot. I pulled in straight. Yeah. I'm not wondering how long those windbags going to preach. Come on. Or where are we going to eat lunch? Yeah. I come to hear from God. Amen. See, that's, it's it. you listening? Yes, sir. Folks, folks, it's the attitude. Christianity is about attitude. It's not, do we have to go to church again tonight? That's right. it's, it ought to be, preacher, why can't we have church tonight? It ain't, well, we're going to have revival all week. It ought to be preacher, why can't we go two weeks? You see, folks, it's about attitude. And I'm going to tell you something. If you've got the attitude of a renter, it's not going to change. See, you can, you know why you hate coming more and more often? Because that's more and more often you got a fake. That's more and more often you got to be plastic. And you got to put on a front and be a Christian in front of everybody's face. See, it ain't hard to be a Christian at home in the dark. But when you have to go out to prove it, let's don't have so many meetings, preacher. This is one of my bad days. I can't put on a face today like I usually do. Folks, if we could just get saved, ask God to fix our attitude. Give us that attitude of a homeowner. I, I'm, being, I'm telling you, folks, listen, I've rented and I've bought. I have rented. I've been in houses. I rented the first house I ever rented, Brother Chris, was down there on 160. That uh, uh, right there by the big pecan orchard, there's a little white house sitting back in the in the in the pasture, a little pond back behind it. If I, you'd know what I'm talking about, in just a few minutes I'll explain it to you. And 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 that that was my first house. When I got married, I took my wife to that house. Well, I, I went and got her in Columbia in a, with a, I drove a 69 Nova with a, with a canary yellow with a rear quarter panel out. <laughs> Puke ugly. And just beat up, worn out, looked like, but you know what? It had clips on the hood. And it had two four barrels sitting under it. I went down the interstate, and the highway patrol come up the other side of the interstate, pulled me over to find out if I was too loud. It was it was tough. I mean, you could it'd sit down, jump a jump a egg, not break it. I, I mean, it was bad, but you couldn't tell it by looking at it. It looked bad. I went down to Columbia, married my wife, picked her up. And drove her back to Carowinds for the honeymoon. Some of you don't know what that is. That's a 
That's about, that is a uh, lower version of Six Flags. Like the one they have in Birmingham. That's what we had, that's where we went on our honeymoon. Anyway, it didn't work out. We didn't get to go. So we coming back home and I broke down. And it wasn't the nicest section of town. And so here I am in my suit, my wife in her wedding dress, carrying her high heels, and walking through this neighborhood, and we didn't know if we was going to get mugged or shot or stabbed or somebody's going to run up and try to kiss me. And she is going to have to beat them off. And I had to call my mother to pick us up on our honeymoon night in an old Ford pickup truck. Here we are. Me, mom, and my wife. <laughs> and we went down. She finally got us to our honeymoon suite. It was a place that I had rented. When you walk in the door, brother, if you look immediately to your left, there's a dartboard hanging on the wall in the living room. And and the living room wall looked like somebody had taken salt and pepper with a shotgun and just blasted about ten rounds from throwing darts. You say, why, preacher, did you do that? Because it was rented. And I didn't care about the place. And you know what the guy came in, the landlord... You know what he did? He said, he said, did you do this? I said, yeah. He said, you sat there and throw darts at this wall? I said, yes. He said, why would you do that? I said, because I put it up. You were too sorry to come over here and put a wall there. So I went down to, to the store and got some old plywood and nailed it up and put up some, some paneling over it, and I'll throw what I want to at it. I said, maybe I'll quit throwing at it if you'll cut the water on. I didn't, I didn't like the place. You say, why, preacher? Because I rented it. It wasn't mine. But I'll never forget the first house God gave me. I, I loved it. Had, had visions for it. Plans for it. I mean, it was just all working out. Are you a renter today? Maybe God saved you, but you're just renting. Why don't you move in? Amen, brother. Why don't you just go out there and get your, get your furniture and your luggage and move in? Amen, and then maybe when that next storm comes, it won't run you off. Why don't you just, some of you is freeloading. Why don't you get in? Yeah. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Brother, place something upstairs. Whatever you need is, you come.